we are initially and possibly by our reach globally and of course because we live in a technological age where things go viral in minutes and seconds that is a real possibility it presupposes to me that a lot of hard work and quality determined inputs must be made by each one of us in this particular area it's not an easy virtue um, to cultivate and to grow upon but like anything else if we first of all look up to the Lord God and ask the Lord Jesus Christ for grace, I believe that God's Holy Spirit will help us. And with some amount of intentionality, consistency in what we do, um, we will get it and we will grow in it because it's a virtue that we can grow in, expand in, and um, live a very peaceful life. And so I want to use two verses from the Bible. Both are in the New Testament, and they will be the backdrop of all we will share in this four or five part series. The first scripture would be from the book of First Corinthians. That's about the seventh or so or eighth book in the New Testament. Um, there are two letters. There is First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. First Corinthians is a book where there's a lot of activity concerning how to live for God. There's a lot of um, uh, wisdom and counsel on marriage, um, wisdom and counsel on love. The, there's actually a whole chapter devoted um, to love, and that's chapter 13. And incidentally, that's the chapter we are going to look at, but we are going to look at just one verse in that same chapter, but further down. The verses on love talk uh, are from verse 1 to around verse 7. And tonight, and as a foundation for this series, we are going to verse 11. And so First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, and I read, this is Paul, the apostle, an, an awesome character. He was a lawyer. He was a steward. He was deeply religious. He was top in his religious field. He was like um, a master in his craft, but he didn't know God. Is that possible? Yes, that is very possible because, folks, we are spirit soul and body and there is a way you can train your body and pump iron and go to the gym and have your six pack and everything and yet your spirit is dead and you're lacking in discernment you're lacking in so many things also you can have a very heightened intellectual capacity your mindset your emotions your willpower is strong or is weak and yet your spirit is dead so Paul had an encounter that transformed his life and that gave him a proper placement and significance and meaning to even what he thought was his profession because he now skipped from his profession into his true purpose. There is your profession, your vocation, and there is what we call your calling, your purpose. The reason why God brought you on this earth that makes you uniquely different from everybody else but makes you complement to society's good. There is something that makes me completely different. Yes, I do have a degree. I have a degree in biochemistry, but I think that can always find its good purpose in my calling. And that's why we say, even in terms of what you do, that gives you remuneration or reward and satisfaction, there is something we call your employment, but there is something greater than your employment called your deployment. God has called you to deploy your gifts, and you must be careful that your employment has not swallowed your deployment, because your employment, more often than not, is somebody's idea of what they want you to do, irrespective of that's what you are wired and cut out to do but because you need a financial remuneration you got bills to pay you got a family to feed you need to do things so you work in that employment and if the salary is not proper you probably leave if there's a cut uh, in the wages or there's a redistribution of responsibilities at the end of the financial year you, 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 you worry and you start looking at it and saying that this thing is not suited to what I want to do certainly not because it's driven by its purpose and its purpose is not necessarily tandem or in tandem with your own purpose in life and so this is what Paul says. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. 
He said, I understood as a child and I thought as a child. So there are three things being spoken about here, or four. One is a stage in life called the childhood stage. And he is characterizing that stage in his life because he's saying, when I was. In other words, I was once a child. And the qualifying characteristics of my childhood stage was were seen in how I spoke and how I understood and how I thought. Speaking, thinking, and understanding, we can comfortably and conveniently say, wrap up everything about our lives. Because ladies and gentlemen, if I speak, then it means that I am speaking from some kind of an understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, if I think, it also means there is something. So my output in my speaking is a function of my thinking and my understanding. From my thinking comes my analysis, and from my analysis, I verbalize. Sense or nonsense, informed or uninformed, well, properly prepared or not, is a function of my stage. So he says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood things as a child. I thought as a child. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you find a child who is speaking and thinking and understanding like an adult, maybe they'll say he's a genius or something is wrong. Um, in some parts of the world, they will ascribe witchcraft to it, unfortunately. But he says, but when I became a man, in other words, something changed in my form, in my structure. And that change we call maturity. Something changed. He metamorphosed, he transitioned from becoming a child to a man. And that's an obvious transition. A male, a boy transitions to become a man. A girl transitions to become a woman. Unfortunately, we now live in a world where a girl can transition to become a man and a boy can transition to become a woman. But that doesn't change the reality of who we are. He says, when I became a man, I put away. In other words, my state, my stage of manhood or womanhood necessitated, dictated, and required me to put away childish things. It doesn't mean that I stopped thinking. It doesn't mean that I stopped understanding. It certainly doesn't mean that I stopped speaking. What it means is this. I stopped speaking as a child when I became a man. I stopped understanding in childish ways when I became a man. I stopped thinking in infantile childish ways when I became a woman because my womanhood and my manhood state presupposes that I had climbed the rungs of the ladder from childhood into adolescence. I probably went into tertiary educational institutions and I was taught qualitative thinking, analytical thinking, how to choose, and I began to learn how to discriminate. So this series that I am studying is entitled Discernment. How to discern what it means to discern, what is discernment, why we need to discern. And as I started in the introduction, I think, I still honestly believe, ladies and gentlemen, that when we get into the, capabil the capacity, the capability, the sense, and the understanding of discernment, a lot of things that we suffer, a lot of things that we are hoodwinked, in a lot of things that make us look like children that easily satisfy our tastes would change. So the crises, the mishaps, and all these kinds of heartaches and sorrowful situations um, will be minimized because we have picked up this virtue called discernment. I think it is the divider between childhood and adulthood. Because in it is wrapped maturity. 
You can give a child a sweet and they can be happy. In some unfortunate scenarios where maybe there is a dysfunctional family and there is a you know, discord between father and mother, you can find that kind of thing. Father buys a bicycle for the child and daddy is the child's star. Tomorrow the mother gives the child a ticket, an unaccompanied minor ticket to uh, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Mommy is a star, daddy is not a star. Because that's children. That's children. Their ability and capacity to discriminate, to discern, is very minimal. And so back to the scripture, Paul says, and it's a fact, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I reasoned like a child. I understood things like a child. I want to say two things that I remember. One concerns me and another one concerns my daughter. The first one is that when I was growing up, I remember at three, four, then we used to use pounds, shillings, and pence. And I remember the penny was um, copper, and it had a hole in the middle. I'm not sure whether it had a star around it, but it had a hole, and it was this big. And then, of course, we had the one shilling, and, you know, if you remember those. And I remember uh, my three older siblings playing this game on me. They can remember, I can remember. You know when people visit and sometimes they just like you, uncles, aunties, you know, visitors come and they give you money, you know. And so maybe they give you one shilling and they give you um, two shillings or whatever. I remember I had these small silver coins and they were like shillings. And then my older siblings had the bigger coin, the penny. And one of them in particular decided to do a trade with me and told me that what I had was small and what she had was big. So can we exchange so I can have the bigger one and she have the smaller one? And believe me, I fell for it. And she still owes me some money. Why? Because I was a child. My reasoning was that big is better than small. Big can give you more than small. But at my age and stage in life, that cannot be true. Why? Because I have matured. I am now discerning. I'm not just looking at size. I'm looking at value. As a matter of fact, I think in our world now, most things that are effective are literally smaller in size than others, like poison, like certain things, salt. You don't put a jar of salt in soup. Every recipe you see that talks about salt always talks about a pinch. And anything more than a pinch can make you not like that food. I also remember many, many years ago, when my daughter was about five or six, and she got into this thing about red. When you wear red, you know, cows will attack you and bulls will attack you. And we tried to explain to her that it's bullfighting. It happens in Mexico and countries like that. And I remember specifically, we told her it was Mexico. And you know how children are like, you know, days went by, and one Sunday morning we were going to church. I remember we were at Jimpex Junction, and there was a herd of cows at that Jimpex Junction. And so she was at the back of the car, and I just heard her say, Daddy, is this Mexico? And of course I said, oh, no. Why was it Mexico? Because she saw a lot of cows, and maybe she related. That is acceptable to children, four years, five years, three years. If you ask a child to sing your national anthem at two or three, you'll hear so many things. If you ask them, particularly, let's say, in Christianity, to say the Lord's Prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, you will hear them say all kinds of things. If you hear, if you tell them to recite the alphabet, A is for apple, B is for B, or A, B, C, D, E, F, G, at age two or three, especially when they get to L, M, N, O, P, you hear lemonopi, all kinds of things. That is acceptable. You even laugh and you really have a good time. If at my age, and your age as an adult, 50s, 60s, 40s, 35, 30, you cannot recite the alphabet, or you start saying funny things, people will look at you and will be shocked. If you are given a document to read and you cannot read it, and people will be wondering what happened because they expect and society and life 
expects that at that age and that stage, you have transitioned from childhood into maturity. So you are not excused anymore. So he says, when I was a child, my speaking, my thinking, my understanding were childish, infantile, understood, accepted, excused. But when I became an adult, I put away, the put away, I put away, I removed from me, I got rid of childish things, childish ways of speaking, of thinking, of reacting. Can you imagine a situation where a child doesn't like the porridge, you know, and sometimes they throw a tantrum, they're on this chair, they throw their feet around, and they splutter the food, they hit their spoon on the porridge, and then, you know, we calm them down and all that. Can you imagine somebody at 45 doing that, 55 doing that, 60 doing that? You'll be shocked. You, it will go viral. Somebody will put them on Facebook or Instagram or Lime or something. It's like, can you imagine what happened here? Because the difference between those stages is that I've now come into discernment. And discernment means maturity comes upon me. Discernment means I'm able to analyze things so that before I speak, I have understood, I have thought well, I have considered all kinds of options and all kinds of case scenarios. I have cross-pollinated ideas with other people because I am at the place in my stage of life where I know that not just my viewpoint is right, not just my way of seeing it is the godly way, but there could be another form. So maybe by the time I come at, especially if I am the face of public um, perception and public reasoning, then I make sure that considered views have been put into it before I speak. Lest when I speak, people cover their face and say, what did that woman just say? What did that man just say? Who advises her? Which school did she go to? Why is this person on TV? And people wonder, because you are not at a stage where you can be excused. You know why? Because maybe the person next to you is doing better. And the person after that person is doing better. And everybody next to you is thinking well, understanding the issues, critically analyzing things, and speaking from there. There is a scripture that Jesus Christ spoke in, I think it's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, somewhere there, maybe between verses 24 and 35. Jesus Christ made a statement which you can take to the bank. He said, for out of the abundance, the plentiness of the heart, the mouth speaks. If that is true and it is, then it means that I must take time, be cautious, spend time making sure that the abundance of my heart is not bitterness, is not infantile, it's not derogatory, it's not loose, it's not mediocre, but that the abundance of my heart is made up of informed decision. I am widely read, I have debated issues, I know what they are, I have seen all the options, so that when I speak, people want to nod in approval, and not necessarily in a psychophantic way, because it's Pastor Forbes speaking. The Lord Jesus Christ said, and I repeat, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So sometimes people say something and they say, I'm sorry, but it's from the heart. And I'm sure we all can say we are guilty of that. I can say I'm guilty of that. Sometimes you say something and you wonder, wow, what came upon me? Why did I talk like that? For each one of us who does any kind of public speaking, and, and anybody, even if you're the MD of a company, an institution, a hotel, a school, a church, if you're in government, anywhere that you speak, do yourself a favor. Ask people to record you, like I'm speaking now, and let them play it for you, and watch yourself. You may laugh, you may be ashamed, you may be say, oh my gosh, did I say that? 
Why did I say that? I kind of suspect that's why in fields like politics and diplomacy, there are speech writers. There are people who, before you read a speech on the environment or children's health or building programs or diplomacy, people have gone behind the scenes. They have written, they have researched, and they are on the top of their game. They have mastered this craft and they have put a speech that is given to me to read, to you to read in whatever capacity and everybody knows that. Yep, she's on point. Yep, she's touching the issues. Because in the absence of that, it is the abundance of your heart that speaks. And it's an awesome responsibility for each one of us. As I said when I started this series a few minutes ago, it will be the divider between how many casualties we have, how many enemies we make, how many things we lose in life, because we are not discerning. We are not building capacity, capability, maybe mental, intellectual, or even spiritual sense to be able to discern between good and bad, right and wrong, offers that look so good, but are going to take us down if we take them, and people who are smiling, but yet they are deceptive because it's really not written in their faces. And not all of us are psychologists and experts who can tell you that somebody's lying, there's a twitch on their nose, because after some time, people master it. There are people who beat a polygraph test, a lie detector test. So nothing in those fields is even God-given. It only takes discernment. And the discernment I'm talking about is a desired qualitative characteristic which you can only get in your closeness to God. And for me, through the Lord Jesus Christ, my personal Savior, my personal Lord. Discernment is required today. We live in a world where all kinds of things are happening. Terrorism is happening. Financial scams are happening. The Panama Papers are out there for everybody to see. So how do you know this person smiling to you is telling the truth? How do you know which aeroplane to fly? How do you know the person sitting next to you is not strapped in a bomb? How do you know who to marry? How do you know where to buy a house? How do you know which profession to take? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? You can play games. You can say any, mini, miny, mo, ndoli, yo, ndoli, and then you choose no. You need the ability to discern. And that ability you can build in yourself, but in a greater dimension, you can get the grace of God upon your life. I want to stop here this evening because there's another segment of it I want to take by the grace of God next week where we'll be taught in the book of Hebrews in the Bible, chapter 5 and verse 14, that strong meat is for those who by reason of exercise have trained their ability to discern between good and evil. So you don't ask people, low for, what do you think? Make a take up, make a not take up. Majelko, dahma baiko. Because the person will tell you from what they know. And what they know may not necessarily be a discerning knowledge. They may take, put you down in life. I pray that we will all pick up this qualitative characteristic. And it will also be a national treasure in all we do. Until I come your way next week, by the grace of God, this is Pastor Forbes saying have a good evening. God bless us all and good night.